Thank you. It, this is, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, and thank you for coming on a, on a bit, pretty chilly uh, Saturday afternoon. So um, what I want to talk to you about today, I'm going to talk to you about two things, as you see. I'm going to, I want to talk to you about my research and try and give you a flavour of what it is that I'm interested in and why I think it's so cool. And then tell you a little bit about my, my research career, which is unusual. First of all, let me tell you who I am. This is my title. It's great having titles. That's why it's good being in Cambridge. So I'm a professor of molecular, so I'm a scientist. And this word molecular tells you something about the scale I'm going to be looking at. I mean, scientists are interested, you know, royal society, natural philosophy, looking at the world investigating the world and asking questions about it. And this molecular gives you a clue that I'm interested in molecules. So I'm talking about things on the, the nanometer scale. So that's, that's 10, it's one divided by something with nine zeros in. So that, that's a trillion, it's a trillion, a trillionth of a meter. So very small things, but it's, this is not subatomic physics and it's not astrophysics. Right? So that's the size scale we're going to. I'm a head of molecular bio. Tells you something about the molecules. I'm interested in biological ones. Physics in the chemistry department. <laughs> and really, that speaks to you about one of the things I want to say. I'm a Wellcome Trust senior, senior research fellow. And the Wellcome Trust is a charity dedicated to improving health. And really, the message I want you to go home to today, with today, is really you can't put science or scientists into boxes. You can't divide it up anymore. This is physics, this is chemistry. But it, it's a really holistic sort of research endeavour. And I want to try and let you know some of the things I do. Now, how many of you recognise this? All the young ones will. That the central dogma of biology is that you have got DNA, which makes RNA, which makes proteins. That's the very central part of biology. And so you are what you are your genes, if you like. You, you, you may have heard of that. We've got genes, a DNA, and the main thing that your genes do is to tell your bodies how to make proteins. And that's the system of biological in information flow. And I'm interested in the next step. These are the proteins, what proteins are, how they get their shape, and how they do what they do. And it's nice being involved in proteins because you have such beautiful pictures. Here's some beautiful structures of different proteins that we work in in my lab. Now, what is a protein then? I've told you we get genes, and I've told you that they form, that they tell the cell how to make proteins. But the, when, when cells make proteins, they're completely unfolded. And these unfolded proteins have to fold. So I'm interested in why... I've got a nice turner, but no laser. I'm interested in, uh, in why one fold protein will fold to this shape and another protein will fold to this shape. I'm interested in how it does it. This will do this in milliseconds to seconds. That's telling you something more about the science. Science is not only on a, on, on a size scale, but also on a time scale. You know, astrophysics, age of the universe. I'm interested in things that go on in, in milliseconds, microseconds, seconds. That's my time scale. So how does it does, do it so quickly? How and why does the protein structure give it a function, the thing it does? And for the scientists, these are questions of thermodynamics, kinetics, and mechanism. And then why do proteins not mis misfold? Why do they not misbehave? Because the very fact that you're here, you're sitting here, and you live a long life tells me that your proteins have managed to fold correctly all the time and not misfold. And that's the question I'm interested in. And of course, underlying all of this is evolution, because proteins have evolved to behave the way they do so efficiently. So here is, there are some pictures of the proteins. This is what a protein looks like. 
The protein is made up of 20 basic building blocks called amino acids. This is the chemistry here. This is an amino acid. And the amino acids all different, differ by what group comes off here. And there are 20 different groups. And as they're made by the gene, the gene tells them to put one after another, after another, after another, after another, in a particular order. Once the protein has been made in this particular order, it can then fold up to form these absolutely beautiful shapes. This is, this is a picture of hemoglobin that carries the blood in your cells. It folds to these particular shapes. And what's really important and what fascinates me is that in this alphabet of just like 20 letters, we've got all the information the protein needs to fold to the correct shape every single time, to fold it quickly and to not misfold. That information's in there as well. To perform the function it was meant to form, to carry oxygen around your blood, uh, to digest your food, whatever it is, and to do it in the right part of the cell or the right part of your body. So you don't not only make it, but you take it to the right part of the body to do a job. So that's what I'm interested. How does this happen? And it's, I'm interested in it. I'll show you a bit later why it is, or may be considered to be important, why the Wellcome Trust, which is involved in interested in human health, why protein folding is important, but I'm interested in it because it's just a really mysterious puzzle. I'm curious about it. So what do they look like? Now, I've shown you some pictures of proteins here. And if I take this sequence and I, and I wind it up, we get these sorts of shapes. But actually, this is just a cartoon of what proteins look like. What proteins actually look like is something like this. Now, each of those dots represents an atom. So proteins are made up of atoms. Proteins are very simple. They're just made of mainly carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, um, hydrogen, with a little bit of sulfur occasionally. And this is a protein molecule in a bath, a bath of water. So these little things here are water molecules with some salt, some sodium chloride, actually. So just table salt in. But this is what the protein looks like in a computer. If you then um, let the computer run, at about 37 degrees at your body temperature. And look what happens to the protein. We can see actually the protein isn't a stationary object, but it wiggles about. And it's quite difficult to watch what's going on here. So I thought that instead of that, I take away all the water molecules and I'll take away all the sodium chloride ions and I'll just look at a protein. This is just a protein sitting in a water bath. So one of the things that we do a lot of in the lab is we do computational studies to try and understand how proteins behave. And here we have got this protein. And what you can see is it's not some sort of still thing. It's, it's really mobile. What's moving this is the water molecules bashing on it because, it because of the heat. This is what a protein looks like in a cell. You could see why we draw those simple pictures because if I just showed you this, you wouldn't have a clue what it looked like. Uh, protein folding happens in the cell. I told you that you make a protein. You make the DNA is found inside the nucleus of the cell, which is here. And the protein folding goes on in the outside of the cell here. And many of the key things that go on in a cell, moving proteins from one place to the, to the other, uh, secreting, and secreting salivary enzymes into your saliva, secreting antibodies in the bloodstream, all those are intimately coupled with the proteins, processes of folding and unfolding. A very complicated picture here, but this is essentially my idea. I told you I deal with molecules, right? That's as far and as intimate as I go into, into larger structures. This is, this is much better for me. So what happens in the cell is the DNA which is in the nucleus, which is over, over there somewhere, makes RNA, 
And on the ribosome, we start making proteins and proteins start coming out and they fold correctly. They don't need any other information. They could just fold on their own. I can take a protein, I can unfold it, put it in unfolding conditions, a chemical that will unfold it, take the chemical away, and every time it will fold back into exactly the same shape and structure every single time. Now, I can unfold proteins in a way that stops them from folding properly. Boil an egg, when you cool it down, it doesn't unboil. Um, but you can find conditions where even the, the, the protein in egg white will unfold and refold without any other way. So normally what happens in a cell is you make the protein, it folds correctly, it does what it's got to do, and then the cell turns it over and degrades it back, makes the amino acids, and you can make new protein. Now, sometimes this fails. And I'm going to talk to you about, a bit about how it fails, but sometimes this fails and the proteins misfold. There's several things that can happen if a protein misfolds. First of all, it can be degraded. And so what happens is, this is, for example, cystic fibrosis. The protein involved in cystic fibrosis is actually a really rubbish folder. Evolution hasn't made it fold very efficiently. Even in people who are so-called normal, uh, only about 20% of the protein that the cell made get to the right place. And the cell, the, the proteins that don't get to the right place get degraded, and you can get diseases like cystic fibrosis. Or they misfold and they don't get to the place that they should be to do the job that they've got to do. Right? In which case you can get diseases like scurvy and emphysema. And these diseases are loss of function diseases. You don't have the iron channel in your lungs, which enables you to clear fluid, to, to balance the fluid control in your lungs. The final kind of misfolding, and it's one which is um, of, of more and more importance as we get older and older and older, are where proteins don't misfold and get degraded, but they misfold and they form toxic conformations in the cell, which can actually destroy the cell and prevent the cell from working properly. Uh, and this includes a huge number of proteins, like Alzheimer's, senile amyloidosis, this is hardening of the arteries and things that most people over 80 uh, suffer from, type 2 diabetes, Parkinson's, you've heard of all these diseases. And all these diseases are diseases caused because proteins fail to fold correctly. Now, I am not involved in my own research in actually investigating the misfolding. What I'm interested in understanding is how do proteins always fold correctly or almost always fold correctly? Because if we can understand the correct process, we might get some insight into, into these disease processes. And in these diseases, you get the aggregates of these proteins, these proteins forming these bunches, and this is sort of, these two are the, are the sort of things that you get in your brain when you've got Alzheimer's, these are the sort of things that you, you get in your nerves when you get um, a Parkinson's disease. What do proteins do? Well, proteins are absolutely vital to everything that goes on in the cell. Your chemical reactions, making energy and things, transport, I've told you about haemoglobin, transporting oxygen around the blood, fighting disease, antibodies are proteins. We work on antibodies, communication, signaling, hormonal, and signaling, things like that, all involve proteins. And the one I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today is about proteins which are important for structure, strength, and elasticity. So here's a whole load of proteins that we've worked on in our, in our thing, and they're all elastic proteins. This one here, if you do this, do you know why your cells don't go apart and fall to mush? Because the cells are held together by proteins like this, which can stretch and then come back. So your cells don't fall to mush. Uh, this one here you're using at the moment, even though you don't know it, because this is in your ear, and it's detecting the fluid vibrations in your ear. Uh, and then this is in your red blood cells and so forth. And so what we wanted to know is how do they function? And actually, this is a protein folding problem. I know you didn't get that, but it is. Here's some physics, right? Pay attention. Physics is easy. Uh, <laughs> this is, imagine this is a mountain. This is a, an energy landscape of a protein. The most stable state of the protein is in this valley here. So proteins stay folded. 
right? This is the unfolded state. It's not so stable. It's up in the valley. In order to get from the unfolded state to the folded state, or the folded state to the unfolded state, there's an energy barrier. This is Italy with a nice warm weather, and this you snowed in in Switzerland here. But to get from Switzerland to Italy, you've got to go over a barrier, right? Now, you add force to this protein. You're going to add some stretch to this protein. What happens is you alter the energy landscape. Now, the most favorable state, the lowest energy state, is the unfolded protein. And it, the barrier to unfolding gets lower. So the more you force the protein, the more it's likely to unfold. So this is a protein folding problem. If you've got a protein that's going to withstand force or detect force in your body, it has to be strong. It mustn't smush when you do this. When you do this, this protein's got to resist folding and hold those cells together. To investigate this, we're going to use, remember, I've got tiny, tiny molecules and we're going to investigate how good they are at withstanding force. So I'm going to put a protein on here onto a slide. Uh, just, this is just a glass slide and I'm going to use this thing called an atomic force microscope. Now at the end here I've got a tiny tiny little hook. This, the size, this is two micrometers. This is about 50 nanometers big, long, this tiny tip. But if I have a protein, I'm only five nanometers. I'm going to push down a tip the size of this roof, this roof, right? It's going to land on the slide where I've got a protein. And then I'm going to pull it. And as I pull the protein, I'm going to push a force on the protein. And I can detect that because I've got, I can detect how bendy this cantilever is. So I've used genetic engineering to make a protein with several repeats of the same protein in a row, and then I'm going to pull it. So I take my little lever, and it's such a thin little lever that just water molecules bashing on it makes it wobble. Right? This is just water molecules bashing on it. Hit the surface, pull it up, pick up a protein, and then I pull. And one by one, these things unfold. And the force is, so this is a single molecule, just one molecule of this protein unfolding. And the forces are in picanewtons. How many, only the young ones, you've done newtons, you know what a newton is, right? This is a picanewton. That's 10 with 12 zeros behind. So really tiny forces, and I can detect these unfolding. And one of the questions we wanted to understand is, how is load bearing related to protein structure? So we took two proteins to, to ask that question. One of the proteins is titin, which is a giant muscle protein, the biggest protein in your body. And it's a giant protein, but it's made up of small repeating units like this. So there's lots of these small repeating units. Uh, this is your muscle, right? And at low force, when you're doing this, this is this muscle that's just sort of sitting there. As you start to stretch it, it just straightens out. And there's an unfolded part of this protein in the middle that straight, that pulls out. And then at very high force, when you really stretch your muscle, the muscle can actually lengthen by unfolding one or two of these proteins. If the proteins didn't do that, then when you did this, your muscle would be stretched and you wouldn't be able to recover. And then they recover again. The second protein that we looked at is in your red blood cell. You've seen pictures of red blood cells, and they squeeze through your capillaries as they go through your body. And they squeeze, and then they've got to spring back into shape. And there's an elastic molecule here called spectrin, which lies, makes a network in the red blood cell membrane. And it's responsible for springing those red blood cells back into shape. So it's elastic again. And this is what spectrum looks like. And again, it's a long molecule made of repeats of the same sort of structure. But now I've got these two structures, muscle, red blood cell, <laughs> muscle, red blood cell. And you can see that they're completely different structures. One is, looks like a spring, literally looks like a spring. And the other one is, is the sort of flat sheet-like structures. So we're going to pull this and we're going to say, well, which one do you think will be stronger? Which one will be stronger and why? So we made this 
protein using genetic engineering. We grew this protein in bugs and then we pulled on it. And what you can see is we can see four little unfolding events which correspond to these spring like domains and then four unfolding events belonging to these, these, these beta sheet domains. And so what we can see is that these, these red blood cell proteins withstand much less force than the muscle proteins. And we needed to ask why. We're scientists. What's the question? Why? And again, we went to molecular simulations to try and help us answer the question. Now, this is the titan. This is the, your giant red blood cell protein. You can see that it's made up of these things that we call beta sheets, these long strips of protein. And I want you to notice here that we've got two strips interacting with each other. Right. Now... I'll show you the picture. What we're going to do in the computer is we're going to take it, we're going to pull it from this end and pull it from that end in the computer. Just like we did in the experiment, I just showed you, when we do that in the experiment, it will unfold when I've had enough force. I'm going to do exactly the same, but this time I can do it in the computer because then I can look at which bit of the molecule goes first. Okay? And here we go. First of all, I want you to look at this little bit here. This is the very, very beginning, the end terminus of the protein, this very first bit. And this is going to go. So now the whole molecule's lengthened a bit, but it's not unfolded. But it leaves my muscle a little bit extra length to stop me from hurting it. And then we pull and we pull and we pull and we pull and we pull again. This protein is very, very strong. Doesn't, doesn't break very easily. We're having to apply more and more force in the computer. Now watch here. Watch what happens. The moment that bit breaks, the protein unfolds. So what we can see in this protein is that this part of the protein here is absolutely essential for making the strength of this protein. Now what do we do? Now we say, okay, this is what the computer simulations go. Now we go back to the lab. We make changes in the mutation. We make mutations in the protein in this region here that we think should weaken the protein. And sure enough, the protein will unfold at much lower forces, which tells us that we are beginning to understand the way that this protein works. Moreover, what we have done is we've taken some proteins, so some, uh, this protein, there are mutations in this protein that we know cause cardiac myopathies, trouble with your heart muscle. And some of these mutations we know are in the regions that are required to keep this protein strong. So we can actually show, relate, the work we've done in our lab on the fundamentals to how this protein behaves in, in, uh, in, in the cell. When we pull, oh, sorry, when we pull, what have I done? Turn it backwards. When we pull this spring-like protein here, it unfolds at much, much less forces. This is like really pulling a slinky. You know, and you pull a slinky too much and it unfolds and it gets grotty. This is, this is a much less force in the computer. And actually, we can relate it to the structures, but we can also relate it to what it's got to do in the cell. In the cell, your muscle protein, which, which goes across your muscle fibre here, that gets pulled in this direction. It's got to be strong in this direction. Your red blood cell, it's got to be like a spring in the network as it squeezes through in this network. So in fact, what evolution has done, it's chosen the right protein that's strong in the right direction. And that's how proteins, that's how these proteins fold. And so, I'm going to skip a bit because I'm talking a bit more slowly, but what we've been able to do in these experiments is to look at how proteins fold and unfold in the cell when, you, when it's doing its job, which is applying force or resisting force. And we've been able to investigate that and then relate it to what actually goes on in the body. I'm interested in it because I think that how 
evolution has evolved these mole molecules that can do such an incredibly different, different jobs. Just using a few letters, 20 building blocks, but can do so many things is interesting. I need to tell you about the people that do the work um, because, again, I think it makes it it's important. These are some of the people that have worked on these projects that I've shown you. And who are they? Well, these guys actually did a chemistry degree in the, as their first degree. So these were chemists. Um, these were biochemists. So they did biochemistry degree. These two were computational chemists. They did comp computational studies. These, Robert was a physicist, Susan did technology, and Sean did engineering. And in order to study these complicated questions of biology, what we need is we need really brilliant young people, but we need people that are prepared to use the disciplines that they learn and apply them to much more complicated problems. So that's my science part of the lecture. I hope it's, uh, for the scientists, I hope it's not been too simplistic, but for the others, I hope you've been able to at least get a feel for the sort of questions we're trying to ask. We're using molecular biology, we're cloning proteins and we're producing them. We're making mutant proteins and seeing how mutations happen. We're using incredibly sophisticated single molecule physics to look at the forces on one single protein at tiny lengths and tiny forces. And then we're able to use really powerful computer simulations to understand the molecular detail of what's going on and relate it. We're working with colleagues in the clinical school to actually see if we can relate that to how we can understand the proteins in health and proteins in disease. For the second part of my lecture, and because it is Trinity Hall's 40th anniversary of having women in science, I thought I'd talk about some milestones in my career. So, you know, and I looked up these, isn't it nice having these, these lovely milestones? And, and, and so this is milestones in my career in science. And I want to tell you about my career because it is unusual. Um, but I want to tell you how I got here and who helped me along the way. Because I think it's very important to realise that we're, none of us are an island. None of us can do things on our own. A few years ago in the chemistry department, I was asked to write um, a, a, um, an article actually called Heroes and Mentors. So I'm basing some of this talk on, on, on that, um, some of my milestone talk on that article that I wrote. So milestones, milestones in my scientific career. Well, they starts in 1950, which was when I was born and when life as a scientist began. I, I'm a grandmother. I've, I've got four grandchildren. And it's so clear to me that we're born to be scientists, <laughs> right? They experiment all the time. What does it taste like? What happens if I shift my fingers in here? What happens if I throw my toys in the pond? I mean, all these things are experimental. And I was encouraged. Here, here's my first hero. This is my mother, Shirley Jenkins. She was the daughter of, of a miner. Um, and the great thing about South Wales miners was they valued education. And so the whole family did what they could do to get her to university to do, to do a biology degree. And my entire life, I was made to ask questions, rewarded for asking questions, rewarding for being curious. You, know, you had to look when you had, when you had uh, shoulder a lamb, oh, look at the ball and socket joint, look how that works, Jane. <laughs> and we're having stuffed hearts. Well, let's cut it up and you can see the bicuspid valves and, and, and all this. Many a walk in the country was spoilt by having to look at how, how the bees and the, and, the, and the pollen things were all, were all fitting together. No visit to the seaside was complete without searching in rock pools. But, but this, and, and, and you know, she, she, my great sadness is she never saw me get a PhD. She knew I was going to, but she died two years before I started. But this is, you know, we can all teach our, our, our children to be scientists, to be curious. Then it became, it was relatively, I, um, 
we moved to, to, to Cambridge when I was about 11. Um, and so I went to school in 11. In 1990, 69, I went to college, I went to university. I didn't get into Cambridge. It's more than one way to get a good scientific career. Um, I, I did apply, but didn't get into Cambridge. Um, and I did a PhD, I did a, a degree in biochemistry in York. And then when I'd finished that, I did what my heroine had done. I became a teacher, I married, and I became a mother. I taught in, Tot in Tottenham, as, a, as a, I taught in many comprehensive schools. The, the highest level I got to was to be head of science in a school in Tottenham. Um, I always taught in comprehensive schools. There's the Welsh miner background, the communist Welsh miners that stood behind me. Um, I went part-time when I had the children. I was good at teaching. I liked teaching. It was, such a, it was such an overwhelmingly rewarding job. And I was going to be a big head of a big school and bloody, bloody, blah. Then my husband came home to me one day and he said, oh, look, the bank wants me to go and, and go to America. So we packed up. We went to live in Atlanta. Tried to teach there. I couldn't teach. I didn't have college English or Georgia history or whatever. And so um, <laughs> learning from my mother that I, I could never sit still. I couldn't stay at home. I went to Georgia Tech, which is, um, uh, and I did a master's. I thought, I'll just update my science. And that's when my second mentor come in. His name was Bud Suddeth. He was a protein crystallographer. And he introduced me to the new study of protein structures, which wasn't there when I, when I did my degree. And I just fell in love with this question. How can this happen? I need to do research. So when we came back in 1990, we live in Saffron Walden, so come to Cambridge. I want to work, I want to do a PhD in the relationship between protein sequence, protein structure, and protein function. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I went to the biochemistry department. I went to see everybody that was there working on this, this aspect, and they said to me, you're 40 years old, you've got two children, go away. Don't bother us. One person said it's not possible to do a PhD and have children. So, determination. Welsh miners, don't let the buggers let you down. Bud had given me a letter for Alan Furst. He was the top protein chemist in the world. He just moved to Cambridge. So I went to see him. I'd been turned down by everybody else. I went down to see him on a cold January day. He said, yeah, come and do a PhD in my lab. I'll give you a studentship. That will pay for your childcare. Come and work in my lab. He's now... Uh, master of Keyes College, Professor Sir Alan First, and he is, he is my hero. I mean, he gave me the chance. He never said, what time are you leaving? He only cared about what you achieved. He never, he never judged you by the hours you did or, 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 or the fuss you made about doing it. You go in, you do your work, you've done it. That's perfect. That's all I care about. So, and I did this, uh, David, at this time when I started my PhD, was uh, seven and Hannah was 11. And two weeks before I started was when my dear mother died. So that makes me sad still. Then I did, I started on what was the normal scientific career. In fact, I did a postdoc in Cambridge. And then in 1997, I got the first of my Wellcome Trust fellowships. Uh, these are highly competitive fellowships, and I managed to get a Wellcome Trust fellowship, and I've had that renewed every five years since then. So the Wellcome Trust has supported my research ever since then. You'll notice, I've never said I applied for a job, because I never have applied for a job in this university. However, um, uh, 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 but throughout this sort of, this, this career, one of the things which I don't think people understand is the importance and, and the value of great colleagues and mentors. I picked out for this article three, Susan Marcus is in Berkeley, Sheena Radford is in Leeds, Carol Robinson is, is in Oxford. These are my rivals. These are fantastic women biophysicists working on proteins. They are my rivals, but they're also my best supporters. They're the people who we've walked the walk along together 
and we've supported each other and supported each other back. And it's one of the great things about the scientific career is the friends that you get. So although I've never applied for a job here, in 2010 I was, elected, I was elected a professor of the university and a fellow of Trinity Hall. And then in sort of 2015 made a fellow of the National Academy of Medical Science, uh, 2013 a fellow of the National Academy of Med Medical Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society. And I did have the pleasure of saying to the person who told me that you can't do a PhD with two children, when I met him at the Royal Society, I said, oh, can't you? Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, so this is my career. Now, my reflections on the career. First of all, the highs. What carries you forward? I love it. I just love it. I love being a teacher, but I really love this. And do you know what? Life is so much far too short to do something you don't love. If you're doing something you don't love, young people, stop it. Just stop it and go and do something else because it's not worth it. I spend all day, every day, with some of the brightest young people in the world. Yeah? I'm 66, I spend all my time with people in their, in their 20s who are brilliant and who love doing what they're doing. Academia is a great job to combine with parenthood, although people don't think it is. It's so flexible. When, when I was a teacher, I couldn't go and see my daughter being third angel from the left in the school play because I was looking after somebody else's children. When I became a teacher, I could. That may, I mean, I came a research scientist, I could. That's not always a great thing. You don't always want to hear the recorders, but <laughs> it, is a, it is a possibility. You find friends and mentors across the world, and I've learned to cherish and nurture them uh, and support them back. And I've learned that a supportive family is very important and that one should choose your partner in life. And my husband has been extraordinarily report in, in, in supportive in this. He was a banker we could afford for, to do without my salary for a few years. That's also a help. Um, the one thing he doesn't do is come to public lectures that I give. <laughs> but there are, there are challenges in my career. There's uncertainty. Every five years I've had to apply for my job. Every five years I could have been out of a job. You get rejected. You get grants rejected. My first fellowship I applied, I get rejected. You get papers rejected. Yeah, yeah, you have to learn to deal with rejection. It's part of the deal. You have to deal with people not actually accepting that it's OK for women to be ambitious. One of my colleagues in the clinical school, um, she, she said the other day, I was talking to her, and she said that she was, she was applying for something, and her head department said, the trouble with you, let's call her Susan, her name isn't Susan, the trouble with you, Susan, is you're so ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, what, what? But you have to learn to, to be proud of being ambitious. Why wouldn't you want to be the best you, the best you are at what you love doing? Getting the life-work work balance right can be tough. It can be tough. So you've got to learn to deal with guilt. Why aren't you a proper mummy, mummy? What, what do you mean I'm not a proper mummy? Well, Debbie makes cakes. <laughs> I buy cakes. <laughs> so you've got to, one has to learn, but this is not just true of science, of anybody doing a career that's worthwhile, that you have to accept if you're a good enough mother, a good enough daughter, a good enough wife, that's OK. You have to allow yourself to be OK. You know, all these super women, these, uh, they have super nannies and super housekeepers and super all sorts of things. Just, you know, I'm good enough at that. And then there's loneliness. When I started in the chemistry department in Cambridge, there were only three, counting me, women group leaders in the chemistry department where there's about 45, 50. 50-ish group leaders. And there had never been a woman professor of chemistry in Cambridge University, ever. I, when I was elected, I was the third to be elected. Now it's better. Now there are six. It's still less than 12%. There, was, there are six women. I'm still the only mother. Uh, there just aren't enough of us around. You know, the, the, uh, 
in this, in this 40th anniversary, there's still not enough of us around. And it can be really, really lonely. It's not lonely in my lab. I'm working with all these great young people. I can't, couldn't possibly be lonely. But it's lonely for my peers and my colleagues because there are too few women around. So let's think about Trinity Hall and the 40th anniversary. This is great. 40 years of women being here. And women should not be saying, thank you, Trinity Hall, for taking us. Trinity Hall has to say, thank you, women, for coming. Because we've had the privilege of seeing many talented women pass through this hall. They've been talented while they've been here. And they've, been, they've shown that they're talented in their future lives. And they enrich our college life and they enrich the reputation of this college. But I want to challenge the college now. And I think it's really good when you have something like a 40th anniversary. It's time to stop, reflect and look, ask ourselves, where are we going now? Not, oh, great, haven't we done well? But, but are we now doing enough to enrich the lives of women in the college? And is the university doing enough to support them? And the trouble is that the college and the university are always very much a reflection of each other. And so it's difficult for a college to be different from the university or the university to be different from the colleges. I might ask, where are all the women? Right? We still fail to recruit talented women in equal or even sufficient numbers as students or as members of the university or as fellows of this college. We know that at A level, women do better than men. <laughs> Fact. Yet, less than 50% of our undergraduates are female. And part of the reason is we fail to attract the best young women to come here. Why? What are we doing that's failing to say, this is a brilliant place, why aren't the best young women in the country applying to come to Cambridge and applying to come to Trinity Hall? And it's not their fault, we must be doing something wrong if we're not getting them in. And we have to make sure that when we get them in, we support them properly. At the university as a whole, women are underrepresented among those getting first-class degrees. We bring in talented women, and yet, and yet, they're not getting first in the numbers they should be. Now, I absolutely fail to accept that's because the women are not as good as the men. We have to ask ourselves, why are we failing to do that? And it's no good just saying, oh, it will get better. And maybe it's reflecting the fact that women are failing to be promoted to senior level posts. There aren't enough women in posts. There's not enough people there to, to act as role models. There's not enough women doing the teaching and the examining. In our chemistry department, we're working really hard at these issues but they simply we need to do better. And there's no, there's no reason to, to, to sit there and say, aren't we great, we've got 40 years. We have to think, what about the next 40 years? 40 years is too long. Where are the role models our talented young women deserve? We have to actively do something to think about it. We've heard about a leaky pipe. So in chemistry, have you heard about the leaky pipe syndrome? Have you heard about it? You, you know the concept? Um, we bring in nationally, um, so, so let's think about the chemistry department, which is the department I know best, but it, it ref is reflected in all the other departments. About 40% of our graduate students are female, right? And about a third of our postdocs are female. That means a really significant proportion of the research done in the chemistry department, which is the best research department for chemistry in Europe is done by women, okay? And then I've told you, only 12% of the lecturers are female. Where do they go? Where do they leak to? This is the concept of the leaky pipe. 
in chemistry A level. Women do better than men. Where are they? Why aren't they coming in to this job? So here's the leaky pipe. The women come in, the clever women come in, and they leak out. Now, there's a great article. Um, and the question here is, whose fault is it? Now, when you hear this, and you hear discussions of this, the discussions go like this. Well, women are put off by, you know, women don't like to fail. Women have children. Men have children too, but lots of people didn't work that out. Uh, wi women have children. Um, women, are, you know, they want to go part time. It must mean equals they're not serious about being scientists. Close brackets. Um, uh, uh, women should learn to write more like men if they want to get a first in history. I've heard that said, for goodness sake. Um, but so, so, so women should. It's always, it's framed in the art of how women should, should behave, how women should change so that they can be more successful. There's a great article by this woman called Frances Hocutt. She, she wrote an article. She was an organic chemist, and that is really a bear pit. Um, she was an organic chemist, and she left. And she said, I hated it, and this is why I left. And she says, when a pipeline leaks, we don't blame the water. We fix the pipe, and we design the, one, the next one to leak less. Why do we blame women for leaving science? Why do we not blame us for not having a, a university, a college, a subject which will keep, attract, and reward the best brains, whatever their gender. Right? So, my final milestone, 2017. A year from now, I will be retired. We have mandatory retirement in Cambridge University. I voted for it. <laughs> you know, Turkey voting for Christmas, maybe. I understand why all the historians and, uh, 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 and the linguists and the English people did, because they can just carry on doing their history and their English and their blah, 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 without worrying. But I'm an experimental scientist. I have to stop. But I voted for it for just the reasons I've been telling you now. We need to get more talented people in. If the old white men and me don't step to one side, there will be no space, no lab space, no grants, no, no jobs for the young people. So I think we should. So am I going to stop? Is this actually a gravestone? <laughs> could be, couldn't it? Milestone, gravestone, who could tell? In this thing, I wrote that my final hero was my granddaughter, Martha, who, when I wrote this, was a year old. And why? It's because there's still work to be done. And this is for Martha. We can't let things lie. We can't say, yippee, look, Trinity Hall, aren't we great? We've let women in. It's their fault if they're not doing any well. You know, we've let them in. They should just be, be doing that. We can't do that. What we have to do is we can't wait for things to improve. When I went to university, I told you, in 1969, there were two women lecturers in York University out of about 20, 10%. There's now 11% in chemistry in Cambridge. I mean, we are not doing significantly better. We've got to actively work to change the way we behave. It's disgraceful saying you can't do a PhD when you have children. It's disgraceful that you can get away with saying the trouble with women is they cry. We've got to change our institutions so that everyone can thrive. This college will never be the best college in the university until it gets, until it, it can, it, can get the talent of every single person here doing as well as they can. We've got to see, and, and the university will fail if it fails to do that. We've got to see value in diversity. We've got to stop thinking that success and excellence looks like us. Right? It looks wholly diverse. So my future career and everything is being dedicated to Martha and to all the rest of the generation of students and scientists to say, we've got to do better. And with that, I thank you for your attention.
two parts that's been fantastically informative and very challenging and passionate, which is absolutely what I would have expected of you. Thank I'm you. sure there are questions uh, that people would like to address to Jane on either or both parts of, of what she said. Claire. I think it's being recorded, so you have to Sorry. talk into a mic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane, for a really good lecture, really interesting and, as uh, Jane said, passionate lecture. Um, I want to focus on the women that you're talking about, including the women on the slide there. What can they do? You said, what can we do? What can they do? What can a young woman do to level up that playing field? They can demand, I, 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 you know, I, I, they could just demand to be allowed to be themselves. I don't think it's, you know, I actually don't think it's a women's problem. I think it's an institutional problem. Um, you know, you, you, I, I just think, I mean, to, having the conversations with everybody, with, with partners, with families, um, Refusing to lie down under the, you, you, you don't like it enough. Refusing, going and demanding to have access to, you know, uh, if you want to, in, in my career, I, I love science. Do you got, I hope you got that. And so um, I've kept my research group really small because um, if you get it big, then you're no longer doing, you, you lose touch with the science. They're doing the science and I'm sitting here administrating. Now, in my department, there are people who think that uh, size is all, size is beautiful. You can tell how clever I am by the size of my group and how, um, how hard equals long hours my group are working. Um, and I think we've just got to be prepared to challenge that perception. We've got to be prepared to challenge it. We've got to have conviction. And we've got to stop being told that we're not good enough if we don't do it their way. So it's being courageous and demanding change. Yes, sorry, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you for such a great talk. Um, my name is Jessica Young. Um, I'm just one question, but before I get to one thing that I found, so um, after I graduated, I went to the civil service. I worked there for about 10 years, and I now trained in the field. And I um, uh, have been doing some work with another university. And one thing that I've really found is that you're really only expected to come through one single path. So as somebody who was doing um, some temporary work that was uh, related to sort of a wide set of skills I had, there was no way of recognising me in the pay structures or in, in titles or in you know, anything that might count towards future job applications or grant applications because I couldn't tick particular boxes saying, for example, I had a PhD because I don't yet. Brackets, yet. We'll see. Um, so I think, I think that's one of the issues, actually, is that that's part of the expecting people to look like us. It's expecting people to come through the sort of undergrad, graduate, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't always, it doesn't actually particularly fit the sort of modern, the way a lot of people are approaching their careers these days. Mm -hmm. But a lot, particularly in my experience, doesn't seem to fit for many women I know who have done something, had children, and then moved to something else. Which is where my question comes in. Um, so I, I have two children. Um, one school age, one preschool. And one of the things, and I love what I'm doing with this sort of second go as a career, but one of the things that I find very difficult is looking around and seeing the, um, seeing the realization of ambition for those people who managed to pick something early on and have stayed in the same, in the same path, who, who have perhaps more opportunity to, say, work on ground because they're being paid a bit more can afford their, can afford more childcare, yeah. or just because they're getting to that point now where you know going to a lawyer and they being made partner, um, you know, that that sort of level. And I find it very hard to start again, again without this recognition, without any ability in some ways to recognise the things I've done before. And I wondered if you could just say a bit about how you found that side of things 
starting to go back and start your PhD? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, and, and, and you're exactly right. It's what I'm trying to identify is that, that, there, that there needs to be alternative ways to run careers. And it's a bit where I get the loneliness thing in. You know, I said it's lonely. You know, I was a PhD student. Uh, all the other people in the lab could go out after work and go to the pub and do those things. And I went home and looked after the kids. Um, so it's a challenge. Um, but we shouldn't be frightened of challenge. And I, but we should also challenge the other people around. The more people do things differently, the easier it will be. And I think we need to have the conversations with our colleagues to say, well, you always organise these things on a, on a Monday, Tuesday night, but you know there's the nights that I can't get out. But actually, I can manage to come out next Thursday. Can we do something then? Um, and, and we need to, ch yeah, challenge, you know, if anybody said to me, well, you, why are you leaving? It's four o'clock. I'd say, look how much I've done. So I, I do think it's having, it's not easy, but nobody says that a career is going to be easy. Having a career and having family or, or, or any career is easy, whether you've got a family or whether you're just interested in, in, in riding or whether you're just passionate about what you do and don't find time because you, you've got an elderly parent looks after or just because you need time for yourself and your friends. Nobody says it's going to be, it's going to be easy. But I think that we've got, if you're determined and do you then challenge people to allow you to do things in a different way? And I think the more people that are out there challenging, this is something we can do, Claire, is actually say, go and contact people. Like, like nowadays, the Wellcome Trust allow you to hold fellowships part-time. You want to hold a fellowship part-time? You can. You get a five-year fellowship and do it over 10 years if you like. Right? So, I mean, but this is only what's happening because people have been going up and people are being succeeding and people are challenging. And also we have to accept if we do things a different way, we might not be having the meteoric rise. Let's not be jealous of the young, thriving academic who actually does have children but doesn't know their names, but is a professor aged 30-something. Because um, what are we in this for? If you're in it for personal aggrandizement, well, that's fine. But you do it your way. But that's not, I, well, not why I'm doing this. Why I like the titles is it makes big people take you more seriously, right? Uh, if you're Professor Clark, rather than when I was just some woman that had a yeah, when I became professor in my department, people started taking me a lot more seriously because before I was just a research fellow. Don't give that it's really hard to get those. Once you get the titles, then you start getting recognition. But that's not what they're here for. I'm here, I'd be doing this because I love it. If I didn't have to retire, I don't know when I would retire. Does that help? I don't know if that helps. There was a question. Um, two, two points. Firstly, I love listening. Love listening to you. It's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I graduated from Trinity Hall back in '96, and I've been teaching science for comprehensive. Oh well, you're doing a fantastic job. job. You're brilliant. Um, and so my first point is something that could be done um, is a little bit of training when you interview the students, not to make judgments based on what people look like, and things like taking the photograph of the blue form, what does that say? Katie's a pioneer, and, and she said, why do you want a photo? And not making judgments about what people sound like or what people look like before you've actually listened to the content of what they're saying would be quite helpful. Um, my second point is, what could I do? What, what could I do to help? Oh, great. So first of all, first of all, um, I, I, you're absolutely right, and I think that, I mean, there's a move now certainly in our department, and I'd like to see it in the college, and uh, to have unconscious bias training. Yeah, that's and I think, and I, are we going to do that for, for now for, 
But in, in, the, in the college, because I think that's something the college needs to think about and do. But I mean, we've had equal opportunities training, but what about unconscious bias training that, that, that does that? Uh, forgive the photos, Katie, but uh, when, you're, when you're discussing people at the interview, you know, we've, we've, been, we've had four days of interviews, uh, and we think, well, who was that? Oh, yeah, I remember that person. But a kid, make sure the photo, that photo is going to live with you for life. So when you get here, it's going to be on your badge. So make sure it's a good one. Um, but, um, but what can you do? You, you can be a great science teacher. Some of the people I showed you in that picture, um, so she, he, the, the, they're science teachers in comprehensives. And... You are at the cold face. What you need to do is to make kids love asking questions. I think you've got the most... Your job is so much more difficult than mine. My academic colleagues here will know that we live with people that complain all the time about how hard the work is and how stressful the work is and blah, blah, blah. They don't have a clue. Um, because you are... You are the number one. We need you to want, make people want to do science. And understand that science is about asking questions and investigating and being curious. It's not about learning facts. And all too much, the national curriculum is pushing us this way. So come and, I'll come and talk in your school if you'd like me to. I love going to schools um, <laughs> to talk about the science, because I just think it's great. So what you're doing, you are doing the most important job being a woman teacher of science. That's brilliant. I think we can have time for a couple more questions. Frank. I'm not a scientist. I found your talk very illuminating and simplistic. We understand it. I'm just curious about uh, your said various proteins associated with various diseases. I wondered if you focused Right. Yeah. Um, no, because my fundamental interest is in the proteins themselves and the, the physical forces that, that drive the information within that thing, um, I have tended just to look at any protein that comes along. Mm. However, um, colleagues, the students that work in the lab, a lot of people in Cambridge are working on uh, proteins that are associated with neurodegenerative diseases, including um, uh, alpha-synuclein, which is related to uh, Parkinson's disease, and A-beta and tau, which are both associated with um, Alzheimer's disease. Some of the fun, the, one of the proteins that I work on um, is, is very much related to another protein called transthyretin, which is related to amyloid associated systemic, uh, systemic amyloid, which is the hardening of the arteries and so forth. And what they discovered, do you remember I showed you that energy diagram? And I said, okay, this is, this is, this is the most stable part, this is the, the properly folded protein, and the other one isn't. What we find is that for, for some proteins, uh, that, that you, it, and it's the unfolded one, which is the dangerous one, that can go off and cause disease. So um, for transthyretin, there's actually a drug in the market that will try and stabilise the, the, the proper state which makes it lower down the valley, right? Which makes the hill it would have to climb to turn into the state that was dangerous a lot more difficult. And so many of the people like me studying biophysics and fundamental, understand the fundamentals of how proteins work, are actually interested in thinking about how could you stabilize the good forms of the protein, which then makes it less likely they'll turn to the bad forms of the protein. Alan First, for instance, is working on a protein called P53, which is involved in a third of all cancers. Now, if you could just, you know, if you could stabilise the good forms of P53, mutations in P53 make it less stable, and therefore you're more likely to get cancer. So he's got a, drug, a program searching for small molecules, which this is the chemistry part of the you know, the physics, chemistry, biology, that will stabilise those 
good proteins make them less likely to switch over. And in terms of something like Alzheimer's, you know, if we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's for 10 years, that would be really great. We'd all die of cancer. The trouble with curing cancer is we get Alzheimer's. You know, I mean, where it is a problem, you know? Uh, wh where do you do? That's why so many people get Alzheimer's now, because they're not getting cancer. They're stopping smoking. They're not going you know, to get emphysema. They're not going to have heart attacks because they're on statins. Um, we're causing a huge problem down the road with, with other things. So certainly the work that I do, although I personally am not working on that, I'm closely associated with and many people in my field are trying to, but we're trying to use the sort of understanding of the shapes of these energy landscapes and how the molecules behave. So which point do we go in and attack the protein? Does that, so does that make sense? And, and this is a huge work. So it, it, this will never, it won't be one person solves this. It's going to be the whole community. Thank you, Ellie. Just one more question. I think over to Tom. Jim, thanks very much. I always find these talks really motivating and inspiring. Um, the question will probably be finished by the time that we get to <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tom. If, if, let's say you play the Euro Millions, then you won a ridiculous sum of money. Right. If Okay. What would you do with the rest of it um, in order to try and sort of um, even out the playing field as useful? I mean, what practically would you do? <sighs> Sorry. For I would, I would, no, that's a good question. Um, I would endow fellowships for returners or people coming in late. I would spend a huge amount of money providing a nursery so that more women can find it easier to, I mean, you know, Cambridge University supply of nurseries is frankly shocking. And it's something I'd quite like the college to consider doing is, is helping a nursery or at least helping staff and students and, and, and people with, with, with fees for childcare. I have actually come now to the opinion, and it's controversial, that if I was queen, I would pass a law that I, I, I would, allowing positive discrimination. I actually think that we should say, until a department has got, say, a third, a university's got a third of its faculty women, um, then preference should be given to women. And I hate the thing that says, oh, we want the best. You know, how do we judge the best? The best looks like we, we do. You know, the, 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 the knowledge that if you, if you paid preference to a woman, you wouldn't be getting the best, makes me so angry. I want to spit. You know, all the evidence is that women are great. So, so I'd also pass a law, because then, then if I was Euro millions, uh, you know, I, I would be able to bribe the government, to take over the government <laughs> uh, to pass a law. So I, but I think support. I think um, you know, I, making... Having a root and branch change of society. My colleagues in Scandinavia, the men go off on paternity leave. You know, they share it. There's no question that they don't. Um, you know, here it's kind of like a mark of greatness. Oh, yeah, my wife gave birth to a child yesterday. OK, then we're not all captain of England, right? You know, like Alistair Cook's runoff, you know. We need to give time to do that. Okay. But, oh, I'll think about that. <laughs> and if you got Euro Million, <laughs> Trinity Hall would be quite happy to take some special scholarship money. Thank you very much. Can we just um, show... Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.